and welcome to the Discriminating Gamer, the board game review show that is not now, nor has it ever been, a Halloweeny. Today, we're going to take a look at A Touch of Evil, Dark Gothic, a deck builder game from Flying Frog Productions. Touch of Evil, Dark Gothic from Flying Frog Productions, is based upon Flying Frog Productions' earlier uh, board game title, A Touch of Evil. Now, where so many of uh, these board games we see today are based in the Cthulhu universe, uh, the kind of dark gothic touch of evil uh, Flying Frog games, they kind of look back at Washington Irving, Edgar Allan Poe, the great American horror writers of the early and uh, mid 19th century. If you have played A Touch of Evil, you know that game owes a lot to the film uh, Sleepy Hollow, the Johnny Depp film Sleepy Hollow. It's it, it almost feels like you're playing a board game version of that movie. Um, now, it, not exactly. I mean, obviously, it, it is somewhat different. Now, Flying Frog Productions is also known for the fact that on a lot of their games, they have this kind of cheesy photography. Instead of artwork, um, they have essentially people dressed up in period costumes, and I know this turns a lot of people off of Flying Frog uh, games. A lot of people have said uh, they don't care for that. I love it. I think it's great. I, I like it because it's different. It's just not same old, same old. It's nice to see people being kind of fun and creative and inventive, and I, I get a kick out of it. I like their photography uh, in their games a lot. I think it's I think it's cool. Well, maybe it's not cool, but it's. Now, the first thing you're going to do is pick a character, uh, a hero that you're going to play throughout the game. You could pick, for instance, the uh, veteran of the American Revolution, the noblewoman, the highway outlaw, or the man of science who looks suspiciously like the discriminating gamer's own Kevin. Now, what's going to happen is each of these characters has a different starting hand, and that's because of a very important and unique mechanical uh, uh, peculiarity of Dark Gothic. Essentially, instead of just one currency, like in the DC Comics deck building game, or two currencies, like in the Legendary games, this game has three currencies and a wild currency on top of that. The three currencies are essentially attack, which is red, uh, cunning, which is green, and spirit, which is blue. You're also going to have honor, which is kind of the wild currency, which can be used uh, to fill all of these other currency uh, requirements. When you receive your starting hand, you're going to receive a certain number of starting cards in those categories. Now, you're also going to start the game with a monster that you're trying to defeat. Uh, there's essentially, there's, there's three tiers of monsters, and you're going to mix up all your tier ones, draw one, all your tier twos, draw one, and all your tier threes, draw one, and then just stack them. So there's three monsters you're going to go through that get progressively harder and that add unique conditions to the game while they are there face up. Now, you're also going to have... Um, just like, say, in, in the DC Comics game where you've got Kick, which costs three, but gives you a plus two. You've got that kind of thing going on, but for all the different kinds of currencies, for Spirit, Cunning, Attack, uh, you've got those laid out there so that you can buy those at any time to kind of increase one of those specific traits. Um, there's also uh, Dark Secrets cards, which you may have to draw. These are kind of penalty cards, and if they come up in your hand, you're going to have to draw another card that is bad things is, is going to happen as well. Now, when you're playing the game, the cards you're going to buy from, uh, they are essentially going to have 
sometimes one, sometimes two, sometimes three of those different currencies on there. And you've got to come up with the numbers to, to get those. Now, if ever you get a card that has a number in gray, a set number in gray, you would have to then come up with any of the three kinds of currencies, um, but you'd have to have that number in one currency. So it's not like you can use you know, a currency, a blue, a, a red, and a uh, green, and then buy something that's gray, you would have to have all the greens or all the blues in order to buy it. Kind of interesting. Now, as the game progresses, some events are going to come out as cards are revealed. For instance, there's a, a, a one of the events is going to force you to take the top card off the deck and put it next to the monster. This becomes the shadows. If ever there are ten shadows, all the players lose the game. Um, so that's kind of very interesting there, too. It's, it's semi-cooperative. You're going for an individual victory, but all, all the players can lose. Now, another very interesting and unique mechanic in a deck builder here, there is a dice in this game. You're going to be rolling dice. Occasionally, you're going to get uh, cards that will tell you you have to roll dice for various reasons. Now, this dice has one, two, three, and four on it, but then it also has two skulls. Now, in the event that you're rolling for a number, the skulls represent zero. But a lot of times, things will say, if you roll a skull, something bad's going to happen. So that's kind of another little interesting, uh, unique mechanic of this game. Now, as the game progresses, uh, you're, 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 you're getting these cards, and then eventually you're going to try to defeat the monsters. Now, at the end of the game... Uh, once all the monsters have been defeated, uh, the investigation number, which is in the bottom corner, that is essentially your uh, victory points. You're going to total up all your victory points for the game, and whoever has the most wins. So what do I think of A Touch of Evil Dark Gothic? Well, I'll tell you right now, this game plays very similarly to the DC Comics game. It feels very similar mechanically the way it works. The chief difference being those three currencies. Where DC only has the one currency power, this has got three different kinds of currencies. And that is, uh, in some ways, both a plus and a minus. It's fun because it forces you to kind of develop strategies in the game and you know try to buy those specific colored cards if you want to defeat monsters or do other things. And that's pretty cool. Um, also, it's interesting on your turn to try to figure out how best you can work your hand to get the cards you want. It can be fun, it can be frustrating as well. And that brings me to, I, I think, one of the potential problems of this game. And that is, this, I don't think I played another deck builder that has quite this level of analysis paralysis. Players are really going to have a hard time on their terms deciding what to do because there's so many options and you're trying to do the math in your head and you're trying to get green, blue, and you're trying to figure everything out, crunch all the numbers, and it just, uh, it doesn't, uh, it, it, it doesn't flow really well. Uh, it, it certainly doesn't lend itself to, to, to good and quick, I should say, quick decisions. Um, to give you an idea, uh, we sit down to play this, a couple of guys, and, and I'd played it before, and then a couple other guys next to us were playing Five Tribes. None of them had played it before. They figured out Five Tribes and got through a game before we finished this one. So, if that's saying something. Now, I will say this. The game plays two to six players. I don't think you want to play with six players. I haven't played with more than four, and I thought four was plenty. Honestly, I think your sweet spot here is two to three players, maybe four. We played it with three, went a little bit faster. Four players was, was not bad, but I'm thinking two to three is your sweet spot here. I don't think that the analysis paralysis problem kills this game or makes it unplayable or unworkable at all. It's just something you got to be aware of. Like I say, go for that sweet spot. I think you'll be okay. Uh, but just be prepared. There is going to be some AP in this game, and you need to remember that. Um, now, also, uh, the dice. I have not played a deck builder that used dice like this before, or at all, that I know of. Um, I liked it. I thought it was fun. I, I, I liked how there was... Now, you, you know, any deck builder's got a healthy dose of randomness in it, so it's not like it, it just interjects this, this randomness in this highly strategic game. But, but it's, a, it, it's a different way. It's, it's just something quick and fun and clever that adds another layer to the game. Um, I enjoyed it. I got a kick out of it. I, I liked the dice. I thought that was a fun, interesting mechanic. So, um, all told, uh, Touch of Evil Dark Gothic from Flying Frog Productions um, is a good game. It's a solid game. You know, I gotta tell you, I'm kind of hit or miss with Flying Frog. Um, I, I, they, they put out just some, some, some really stellar stuff, uh, and then some of their stuff that I really liked initially kind of went downhill after a while. It kind of got, got old with me. 
But I like this game so far. I think this is a fun game. I don't think this one will get old. I think I'll be playing this one for a while. Um, I, I really, really enjoy Dark Gothic. I think it's a solid deck builder. I think you're going to get a kick out of it if you give it a shot. So the recommendation for the Discriminating Gamer for Dark Gothic is buy it! Thank you once again for joining us today on The Discriminating Gamer. As always, we ask you to please, please, please like us on Facebook and subscribe to us on YouTube. And just remember, just because you're playing Dark Gothic, that doesn't mean that you have to wear black and listen to The Cure while you play it. Because... Because of goths. Please somebody help me. I'm on my feet again. And I don't know where...